Hello and welcome to Bay College's video lectures for intermediate algebra. This is section 8.6, which introduces common and natural logarithms. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is common logs, which means base 10. And the reason why this is the common log is because our number system is based on factors of 10. If we look at the decimal point of our number system, anything to the left of it is a factor of 10 compared to anything to the right of it. So when we deal with common logs, it's so common because our number system is based off of a base 10 number system. So when we see a log base 10 of some argument, it's actually equal to log of the argument. It's so common that we do not denote a base. So whenever you see a logarithm that, that does not indicate a base, where the space for a base is blank, you have to assume that this is a common log. It is a base 10 logarithm. So let's look at an example here. We have log of 100. Well, being that the base isn't indicated, it is a base 10. So what does the log ask? It asks 10 to what power is 100? Well, I know 10 squared is 100, so this value is 2. 10 squared is 100, so log of 100 is 2. What about log of 1,000? Well, this is a factor of 10, 10 to the third. So log of 1,000 without the indication of a base, I assume 10. 10 to the third is log of 1,000. Here is it's a little tricky, but as I said, our number system is based on factors of 10. This value here, 0 0.01, is the same thing as 1 100th. These two values are actually read the same way. So if I have a decimal, I know that I'm going to have a negative exponent because the factor of 10 is in a denominator, 1 one hundredth. So this would be 10 squared. In a denominator, it would have a power of negative 2. 10 to the negative second is 1 one hundredth. And this is 1 one hundredth. So the value here would be negative 2. Now, what if we're dealing with common logs, base 10, and they don't have a nice factor of 10 in the argument here. Well, let's look at this here. We have log of 500. In the previous section, we explored the rules of logarithms. And if we truly want to think of why we are learning this, well, 60 years ago, we didn't have calculators. They weren't accessible to the public. Computers were, you know, they occupied entire rooms. They didn't have personal computers, let alone calculators. So what engineers who generally worked with these and, and uh, in other fields as well, they had a book of logs. But it couldn't list every single logarithm. And since they didn't have a calculator, they used those properties of logarithms to break this down into something smaller. So I'm going to do that as an example for this one here. I have log of 500, which is not a perfect factor of 10. But I know the base is base 10 because it's a common log. It doesn't indicate the base. So I'm going to rewrite this using my properties of log. I know that 500 is 100 times 5. Using the product rule of logs, I can split it up log base 10 of 100 plus log base 10 of 5. So log of 100 plus log of 5, this is something I can evaluate. 10 squared, just like we saw in the previous example. So this is 2 plus whatever this value is. So I could refer to my book of logarithms and find the simple logarithm of log 5. And I find that it is, and I already cranked it into a calculator, because we do have that luxury these days. This would be 2.69897. And this is a, an approximation, because we have the log of 100, which is 2, plus the log of 5. Well, this value is less than 1 factor of 10. This value is less than 1, 0.69897. So when we put two together, we get 2.69897. Now, at this point, I'd like you to have a calculator uh, available to you as we go through the rest of the video. Plug this value in, log of 500, and you'll get this value to so many decimals. It is an approximation, because even our calculators have to round off that decimal to some point. But we're going to five decimals. 
Well, what if I had log of 242? Well, if I do an initial assessment, I know that this value, because we're dealing with base 10, is somewhere between 100 and 1,000, those nice whole integer powers of 10. So if I plug this into a calculator, one way to know that I'm on the right track is to know that whatever the value is should be somewhere between 2 and 3, the powers of 10. 10 squared would be 100. 10 cubed would be 1,000. This value is somewhere between there. So somewhere between the powers of 2 and 3. When I do plug this into a calculator, I get 2.38382. And there would be other decimals in our calculator. But again, we're going to five decimals. So 2.38382. To check your work with a logarithm, take the base of 10, raise it to this power. And because we had to estimate, you'll get really close to 242. What about this value here? Hopefully, we don't even need a calculator. But I do want you to put it into a calculator. And if you do that right now, hopefully your calculator tells you that this value is 0. Because regardless of the base, this is one of our rules of logarithms. The log of 1, regardless of what that base is, is always 0. Because any base to the 0 power is 1. Now, Put this into your calculator. And depending on the type of calculator you have, it should tell you something about this value. This is not a value. Log of 0. We can't take the log of 0. It's a domain error. So maybe your calculator says domain error, or maybe it just says error. It really depends on your calculator. You might get this message when you plug that in. So plug it in, see if you get that message or something similar to it. It might say error domain restriction. Also, this value here, because when we talked about exponential and logarithmic functions, we knew a little bit about their domain, the log of a negative. Well, you can't take the log of a negative, but you can try to punch it in your calculator. And you may get uh, something that either says error or it might even say non-real solution. So this is not real. And for intermediate algebra, that's as far as we're going to go with, that, with logarithms of negatives. This is not a real value. It's not within the domain to be able to take the log of a negative value. All right, <clears throat> let's look at some examples and use some tools that we learned before. Now, here I have log of x, and it's base 10, because it doesn't indicate that. It is a common log, equals 2.2. Well, if I were to uh, solve this equation, it's, the argument is my variable. So I'm going to rewrite this as an exponential equation. I identify the base to be 10, a common log. And this is the power, 2.2. This is something I can plug into my calculator. But because my calculator is going to round it, I know it's an approximation. When I put this into a calculator, I get 158 point, and we'll go to four decimals, 4893. So if we think about this, I have the base of 10, and I'm raising it to a little bit more than 2. While 10 squared is 100, this value should be more than 100. And we see that it is. So we can estimate those values instead of relying solely on that calculator. Well, here we have, in this next example, we have 10 to the x power equals 26.4. Well, if I'm going to estimate a solution, this power has to be more than 1 but less than 2, because 10 to the first is 10, but 10 squared is 100. This value is somewhere between 10 and 100. So this power has to be somewhere between 1 and 2. So to plug this into a calculator to find an approximate solution, or at least more approximate than 2 or, or between 1 and 2, excuse me, we can rewrite this equation as a logarithm. Log base 10, which is a common log, so I don't have to indicate that, of the argument 26.4. This is something I can plug into a calculator. And when I hit my log key of my calculator, and I put in this value. Depending on the type of calculator you have, you might have to put in the argument first and then hit the log key. It really depends on your calculator. We get 
an approximate value of 1.421 uh, so <clears throat> I'm only going to four decimals. Your calculator carries it out a few more. But if you round it to four decimals, this is the approximate value you would get. So what I want you to do is very similar to this one. Rewrite this as a logarithmic equation and solve for x. So try that one on your own. Let's look at another type of log, and it's called the natural log. This is of the base e. And we touched on uh, the natural number in a previous uh, video for this chapter. But e is nothing more than an irrational number. If we think about the value of pi, some of us are very familiar with pi. We know that that's 3.14. Maybe we know it to a few other significant figures. It's 3.14159264, and even that would continue. So <clears throat> if we're familiar with pi, we should become familiar with e. e is just a symbol that represents this irrational number. 2.718281828459.0 in this value would continue on and not have a repeating decimal. It doesn't terminate. So if we think about e, it's just a number similar to pi, except it's a different value. So we just use this symbol. On our calculators, we might see this value here, e to the x. This is what we're going to use in our calculators because we have that convenience. And when we talk about the natural log, we should see this button right underneath it. So you might have to hit Shift to access e to some power, but the ln key is a key on there. Now, it's called the natural log, so you might think it would be nl. But because many of our mathematicians in the 1600s were of the country of France, the Latin-based languages speak a little differently. This is log natural. So natural log, log natural, that's why it's ln. That's the symbol we use to indicate log of base e. So if we have log base e of x, a shorthand notation is ln of x. This indicates base e. The base is this irrational number. Now, we might think, well, why do we have this irrational number? Why do we have a specific log? function on our calculators for this number. Well, this number appears in nature. It appears when we talk about exponential growth of things like bacteria. We see it in business when we talk about compounding interest. And that's something that we're going to look at as an example before the end of this video. So let's look at ln of 4. Let's find this approximation. We're going to use our calculators. We're going to hit that ln key and put in the value of 4. And if we think about e, e is 2.7 something. Okay. Well, if I raise 2.7 to the first power, I would have 2.7. So I know this value is going to be more than 1, but it may be less than 2. So it's going to be a relatively small value. And if I do put this into a calculator, I'm going to get 1.38622. One point three eight six two nine, and this is an approximation to five decimals. So plug this into your calculator, and you should get a similar value. Know where that uh, function key is for a natural log, so that you'll be able to utilize it. The next example we're going to look at is ln of eighteen. Now, if e being an irrational number, it can sometimes be a little bit more to es difficult to estimate than base ten. But if I look at this and say, well, e is a value close to 3, and 3 squared would be 9, and 3 cubed would be 27, so powers of 2 and 3 would get me close to this value. So I'm going to assume that my value is somewhere between 2 and 3. So when I put this into a calculator, I'm going to take the natural log of 18, and my approximate value is going to be 2.890. 37. So we can see that approximation. Type that into your calculator. And make sure you get that value. But realize that you should be able to estimate it. Let's look at this here. And I'm going to put an equal sign. If you put this value in your calculator, and hopefully you're following along and doing that, you will get the value of 1. This is equal to 1, because what does a log ask us? Well, regardless of the base, it's saying the base to what power is the argument? 
e is our base here. e to what power is itself? e to the first power is e. So we get 1. What if we put in this value? Well, if we put this value into a calculator, we get 0. And hopefully we recall one of our properties of a logarithm is the log, regardless of its base, if its argument is 1, is always equal to 0 because anything to the 0 power is 1. e to the 0 power is 1. It holds true. And again, we have ln of 0. If we put that into our calculator, it's going to tell us there is an error, domain restriction. If we put in negative 4, we're going to get a similar message. Maybe it says error, or it says not a real value. So be aware of that. You can't take the log of 0 or the log of a negative, regardless of their base. Just like we saw with base 10, we see that with base e as well. So let's look at some examples where we might have to solve a logarithm or exponential equation with a base of e. Ln tells me base e, so I know the base. I know the power. This is the argument. So I can rewrite this equation into exponential form. e to the fifth power is x. Now this is something that I can plug into my calculator, which I've already done. And I got 148.4132. Now this is an approximate value for x because I had to round it at some point. The calculator may carry it to a few more decimals, but it still has to round it off at some point. So we'll go to four decimals. This would be the approximate value of that x. And we can check our work. If I go back to my calculator and take the ln of this value, it will tell me 5. What if we have this example? We have an equation where we have the base of e to the x power equals 25.2. Well, I can rewrite this as a logarithmic equation, ln of the argument 25.2 equals x. Now, this is something I can simply plug into my calculator, ln 25.2. And I'm going to get an approximate value of 3.2268. <clears throat> so we see we have this value. And if we think about it, e is a value uh, almost 3, but not quite. And if we think 3 cubed would give me 28, this number is pretty close to 28. Obviously, this is a little bit more because our base was a little less than 3. Now, e to the x equals 7. I want you to do this one on your own. Uh, rewrite it as a logarithm and solve for that power. Now we're going to look at an application of where we're going to see this will lead into uh, e appearing in nature here. So we have compound interest. In this application, you can see we have exponents. And when it comes to solving exponents, we use logarithms. So this is a related uh, example here. For compound interest, we have to define what these terms mean for our compound interest equation. You may or may not be expected by your instructor to memorize this. But what we have here for compound interest, something we use very common in business or in banking or anything like that. Maybe you purchase a, a home or you take out a loan, or maybe you have a savings account. It's going to follow a compound interest or something similar to it. So if we define the values we have here, a is the total end amount after some time of being in an account or, or gaining interest at some point. p is the principal, how much money we're initially starting with. r is the annual interest rate. And hopefully we recall, if we're given a rate as a percent, we have to transform that to a number, move that decimal place. N is the number of times of compounding per year. Now, it may say annually, which means one compounding. It might say semi-annually, which means two. It might say uh, quarterly, which means every three months, so four times a year. It might say monthly, or daily, or biweekly, 26 times a year, or weekly, 52 times a year. So we have to watch this, uh, the terminology when we come to application problems, because 
the number of compoundings might not be clear. It might be given in words such as semi or quarterly or something like that. And t indicates the number of years. So of these variables, a is the amount after uh, the end amount after some time. p is the initial amount, what we put in. And we have 1 plus the interest rate over the number of times per year we're going to compound it. And what it means to compound is we're going to add interest to it before the end of the year. And again, we have n, which is that same variable here, the compoundings times the time t. So let's look at an application here. I want to know the amount of money if I invest $100 at a rate of 2.5% compounded semi-annually for 10 years. So I'm going to put $100 into a, an account that's earning 2.5% interest. And every six months, semi-annually, twice a year, they're going to take my interest and add it to my principal so I can earn interest on my interest. That's good news for me. And I'm going to do that for 10 years. So I'm going to use the equation, the amount equals the principal, which is $100 times the quantity 1 plus the interest rate 2.5% is 0.025 over semi-annually. That means n equals 2, twice a year. Raised to the nt, which is n times t, 2 times 10. And if you wanted to simplify that, you could say, well, that's just 20. Now, Here's a value. I could simplify this. I could add 1 and then raise it to the 20th power. Well, since we do have the benefit of calculators, this would be a good time to use one. And we're going to find that if I take 1 plus 0.0125 and raise it to the 20th power and multiply it by 100, be sure you're following order of operations, I'm going to get an amount of 128. 0.20, and that decimal is going to continue. But since we're dealing with money, our initial investment, we're going to round it to the 100th because that's our monetary unit here. We go to the penny. So we get 128.2 or $128.20. Now, what would happen if I changed? my compounding because I want to earn interest on my interest. What if I said, well, let's compound it quarterly. Well, that would be four times. Or I say monthly, that would be 12 times. Or I'd say weekly, 52 times. Well, what if I went daily? Could, could this earn me so much money that I'd be filthy rich? Well, that'd be awesome. But what we find, what happens, is let's go back to this original equation here. If we compounded it, an infinite number of times. If we added the interest at every moment that we were gaining interest, what happens to this equation? Well, n is getting infinitely large, because we're going to compound it over and over and over and over. Well, if I divide a value by a large number, it gets smaller and smaller. So this becomes 1 plus a value that's getting closer and closer to 0. 1 plus almost 0 is? almost more than 1. It's 1 and almost a little bit more. But I'm raising it to the infinite power. Well, 1 to any power is still 1. And since this value is getting closer and closer to just being 1, 1 to the infinite power actually becomes this equation when n goes to infinity. And this is something that's called a limit. And that'll be introduced in uh, the next math class. But what we get is a equals p e to the r t. This value actually becomes e, a fixed constant. right? It's, even though it's an irrational number, it's just a number. So <clears throat> it wouldn't result in making me all this money because it has a limit. And that limit is the natural number. So if, if you wanted to, for, uh, just to see what happens, do this equation with, let's say, $1 here. And keep raising n to the highest and highest and highest power and see that that value will eventually become e. So let's look at continuous 
compounding interest. Here we have a, the, essentially the same example, but we're going to let it compound continuously. That means we're letting that n go to infinity. So we don't need n here because it decayed to e. It has a limit of e. So the equation for continuous compounding is a equals pe raised to the r t. So if I want to know how much more money do I get if I compound it infinitely, well, if I invest $100 at 2.5% for 10 years, compounded continuously, n is infinity, I use this equation here, a equals 100 e raised to the 2.5%, which is 0 0.025 times the time 10 years. So I'm going to put it into the same account uh, or the same interest for the same amount of time, but continuously compounded. And if I plug this into a calculator and make sure you follow your order of operations, I'm going to get $128.40. Well, even though I compounded it infinitely, I only made 20 more cents. So it does have its limit. So 128.40, well, yeah, that's more if I compounded it infinitely, but it's not a significant amount because 2.71828, that value of e, is not a value that much greater than 1. So we earn that much interest. So this has been an application of continuous interest and compounded interest. Uh, this has been Section 8.6. Thank you for watching.